<laughs> the recording has started. It started a long time ago. No, I just started it now. <laughs> okay. Someone else started it too. But I thought you were, were going to say good morning again. Good morning. <laughs> Hello. Oh boy. <laughs> I we started. I'm not. I'm out of position. The wires aren't ready. Right. Hold on. So in about five seconds. Six, in about six hours, when Bill actually turns this on at you know, oh dark thirty, he'll get a nice good. He'll morning get a nice good me. morning. That's right. right. Yes. Yep. Uh, yep, this is a great. I'm glad we started recording. You should not this is, be this recording. Really this. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, this is how the sausage is made, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, it's not good. To our listeners, as we wait for Jeff, who says, Oh, no, I'm ready. And he's the one who has control of the button. Yep. Come on, music. Where's the music? There's the music. Only the most professional podcast you've ever been in your life welcome to everyone racers it's the only a podcast i've ever done in my life so yeah it is a show designed for the world of low dollar racing and oddball podcast intros it doesn't matter what kind of lemma champ or lucky track dog league you run scc or nasa we won't discriminate as long as you drive it hard and built it yourself join us each week for tech discussion tips tricks news and notes in the world of amateur endurance racing and whether it's on the spot hello sweet or we're lucky enough and chrissy gives us just the tip we're sure you'll giggle a little and learn even less everyone report to the paddock this is chris this is chrissy i'm jeff and I'm mental. And we are Everyone Racers. Thanks for coming back and listening to a Messerschmitt episode of our podcast. It's episode number 175. The Messerschmitt KR175 Kombinenrolle was a mid-engine rear drive microcar produced from 53 to 55. And that's saying they made over 15,000 of them because really post-war Germany needed something cheap to move around. So uh, the name Kombinenrolle means scooter with a cabin, which it was. So if you're not in a tiny micro car or a regular car, hey, don't forget that bingo card. I love the ME175. <laughs> like, I think out of all the micro cars, like the peel is stupid looking. Like, this is the coolest looking one. It's got little tail fins even. Like, yeah. It does. It does. I I considered putting phonetic spelling of that. And I thought, Come on. Chris, Chris will nail it Chris first it. time. And uh, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, exactly. German. <laughs> German is easy. It's just say every letter. I'm going to have to get you to do Josh's homework. Okay. N nine. <laughs> nine. nine. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, take Spanish. Then mommy and daddy can help. Nine, he said. Nine. <laughs> anyway, someone asked me what I'm working on so I can go. What are you working on, Jeff? Thanks. So I went car shopping since last week. But, you did. But more on that later because we're going to put it in the hell of sweeter but terrible. And you can all make fun of me for all the decisions that I've made. But just so you know, it included a trip to Baltimore. And I was flying under the new, my new uh, Valentine 1 version 2. I, 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 I actually am anticipated. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's amazing. I cannot believe that I was riding under such a crappy ass old detector that went insane every time I passed the Nissan Altima with blind spot radar. And I am like, I, I, I cannot say more that you, everyone needs to go get a Valentine one or update your radar detector. If it's more than five or 10 years old, especially because... if your car is already hardwired for it. It's yeah. So easy. Yeah. So We're looking at you. Yeah, you should. I am. <laughs> so uh, I also bought a like $25 mount off of eBay, and it's fantastic. If you're using suction cups on a window, just just join like the 20th century. Now, is that for the radar detector? Or for the radar detector. For the, uh, for the radar detector, yeah. Where do you have it mounted on your car? Uh, I, I, I have it gripping the uh, rear view mirror stock. So it sits directly under the rear view mirror and it is okay, like good. the face plate is flush with the rear view mirror. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think I'd get this many questions or else I would have taken a picture, but that's no, a solid choice. Yeah. Like I always try to mount mine above the mirror, like in that little pocket of, of glass above like the between, mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Because then you can flip them visor down still and not interfere with it. And, and, and hide it for, yeah. Cause if you, if, if, and, and they're they're getting better, but back in the day, if you got pulled over, 
you immediately stuff that thing under a seat. Oh, I absolutely stuff it under my yeah. seat. But still I still do in Virginia totally. all could, the time. I could yank yeah. it off without any trouble. Uh, in Virginia, they got said. the yeah. In Virginia, they've got married the more than detector. twenty years. Trust me. And you're, and you're busted anyway. So yeah, if you've got one in Virginia, which just that is still oh. a constitutional law. In the so. States. So I was gonna maybe I, I I couldn't remember if it was Virginia or Maryland. So I was driving through Maryland, like Googling, Chrissy, trust me, I stopped before I Googled. So I was on 95, stopped sure. Googling. <laughs> you are not like <laughs> like it, not. like yelling into my phone, radar detector laws in Maryland. Cause I thought it was Maryland. But then I was like, well, I have my old like passport on the passenger seat if i get pulled over i'll just be like yeah fine take it dude go ahead <laughs> oh darn yeah 20 year old passport anyway i want to say that uh because i want to talk real car stuff on the way down my rear brakes on the mazda 3 started grinding like really bad so like the left brake has no more brake material on it whatsoever. And if you remember, uh, last time I was at your house, we it was too cold. And I was like, oh, it's too cold. I don't want to fix the tie rod end on my Titan. So now it was I 40. It was 40. Degrees. It was gorgeous. It was beautiful. Right. So now this weekend, I will either have to do a brake job or a tie rod end job on my Nissan Titan or else. Oh, my gosh. Nothing it's so cold this drive. weekend. I know. <laughs> it's going to be stupid. Um, we also had a bit of a mouse in the house situation. So I had to tear apart my kitchen stove. And in an effort to tear it apart to catch the little bastard, uh, I actually broke two of the internal gas lines in my stove. I mean, it between only happens to you between well, like you know the, 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 the handle and the burner. So like nothing <laughs> was leaking. Yeah. You know why the mouse got in is because it no longer got electrocuted by the floor, by the door. Exactly. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, I, I changed my house from gas. Remember I used to live in a propane house. Yep. So when I when I moved back to a gas house, I had lost the gas orifices for my stove. So I had to buy new orifices to hook it up to 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 I Chrissy's the only one who cares about gas orifices. Uh but I happen to have everyone a, wants to hear about your gassy orifices. Right. It's fine. I Keep happen going. to have a whole set of lines in my garage because I couldn't buy the orifice without replacing the lines. So I literally took care of it while you all were uh you were racing uh, on Monday night. So how long did it take you to find them in the garage? Oh, five seconds. I knew right where they were. I literally oh. walked in and went, boink, pulled Which them right off the Which pile of crap are they in? Knew, dig, I dig, knew dig, exactly dig. where they were. Because <laughs> they're in a box. So anyway, that's mm -hmm. what I did. I, I Everyone home repair. Chrissy, what were you doing? Oh, not much. Uh, laying low over the weekend, took some Christmas stuff down and uh, doing a little packing to get out of town. Ooh. Mental. Our oh, yeah. <laughs> We're just getting out. Mental, tell us about what you're up to because it sounds like that's exciting. And by exciting, you mean giant pain. Yes. I. The, our more dedicated listeners remember about a year ago, we had a, an unusual thunderstorm, which we don't get those very often here, but uh, I, I believe I'd come back from Barber and actually that night it rained and we had some water spots on our ceiling. And this was right at the start of the pandemic. So we called our insurance company and they said, we're not sending inspectors out right now uh, because we don't want people in other people's houses. And they, they soft closed our homeowner's claim pause basically and until the pandemic was over and, and it slipped our mind because we went almost 300 days without rain and then this past friday night we had another nice uh, thunderstorm after several windstorms over the summer and then monday we uh, if you guys were following the news we got snow i didn't get snow but about a thousand feet above me 10 miles that way uh they got a lot of snow and the spots got bigger and then Vicky came home and was watching some TV and went to go check on her phone that she'd plugged in. And there our ceiling was leaking all over our bedding and mattress like leaking everything. enough that you need to put a trash can like under it. Yes. Wow. Very much. So we then called uh, our insurance company and they're like, got it. We'll, we'll have somebody out right away, but 
they came back and said they can't make it they'll be there tomorrow they guys showed up uh, uh tuesday morning and um in the course of them the water mitigation they can't get on the roof because of osha regulations until it's done raining even though i have a flat roof they can't get up there and during that time the ceiling is now uh i have a half foot gap in one of my blocks of sheetrock that is now cracked and rather than so much that i had to have a trash can it was basically a hose mm, pouring, nice. pouring water. that's so, so we're a metal crazy close yeah. to the mic like sorry can't hear so yeah now we we've we had the water mitigation guy i've got blowers all over our house we had to empty out the furniture my mattress is probably a write-off definitely the carpet is right off the pads are right off we're gonna have to have the whole ceiling redone oh, in no. the bedroom and in here in my office uh the the whole house is chaos and stressed beyond belief because everything in my house is a pile of stuff and it's disorganized and it bothers mm. me and I'm twitching a little bit all the time and it's going to be like this for months. Why for months? Why? Because they're going to have to redo my roof before they can redo my fix ceiling. The ceiling before yeah. they can fix the redo floor. The floor. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. You are in contractor hell. I am sorry to hear that. Mm. Well, and, and, and I can't complain about my insurance company. They've been fantastic. This is just the nature of how it's going to go. And of course, we haven't had rain for 300 days. I'm not the only person that had this problem. The, no, you're the not. Whole, whole yeah. city, you know, they're like, oh, but, you know, so all of the roofing companies and the inspectors and stuff, they're all busy as crap. So, you know, they'll, they'll get, to, get to it. But yeah, so this will be an ongoing spot. Uh, Chris, can you give some advice so everyone can check off Chris talks about insurance? Oh, well, no, Mental's wor- real name is Chris. So I say Chris talks yeah. about insurance is officially can be checked was, off on your phone. He's doing I feel the right like things. Lawyer, I feel like that's lawyer ball. He's Chris doing the right things. He is sure. he is mitigating his damages. Okay, there you go. Now we have it for real. Trying to cover some stuff up and move stuff out of the way. I'm trying to make the damages not get a little any worse. If anything, though, mental, I would suggest you go up and you put a tarp on that roof over the hole to really help make sure that if any more rain comes through, you don't get it. And, and early on we did, but we had all these wind storms and it was just ripping everything off of there. And, you know, so in, in, part of the water mitigation guy is and this is a profession is emergency tarper mm-hmm. that's totally like that. yeah uh, but like you said he's like he came out and he was he's like i i'm not legally allowed on your roof until it stops raining you figure because, the emergency tarper would be the one guy who's allowed up well yeah. if Some it's raining shoes it, that but my roof Damn, is called flat. cougar paws yeah my my roof is this but rules are rules and if he went up there and emergency tarped it then he's in violation of osha and my insurance company fusses blah, at him. Blah, 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 blah. no we won't fuss at him at all no. <laughs> seriously we don't care we'll just pay his bill like okay yeah you tarped the roof okay thanks here you go we won't fuss <laughs> well, his, and, his workers comp carrier might fuss at him yeah that's who it is well, and that's and that's Rules are there to take up the slack when the brains run out, but also dealing in my regular profession, I know what happens when people start bending rules. And he looked at me and realized this was dumb as he said it, but I understood, dude, you, you can't pick and choose when you adhere to the rules. Anyway, I digress. Big hole in my roof, house is in disarray, mental is losing his ever loving Mm. mind. Everyone homeowners. (laughs) (laughs) Chris, talk about cars or something. Yeah, I've actually been working on cars. I'm like any y'all fools. Um, working on the Z because someone's got to do it. Duh. Uh, the power steering is a fitting and fluid away from being done. That's amazing. Because okay. last I saw, it was like, yeah, I'm going to have to figure that out. Yeah, yeah I'm going to have to all he's been doing. Lines. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, I wasn't sure that. that you had a good plan. I had a plan. And Come on, part, he always has a plan. plan. But a plan is different than a well and thought the, out plan. The, and the last fitting arrived today. Only so like for I, you and me, Chris, a plan like, is always a well thought out plan. Like I could have, I could have the power steering done in about 20 minutes if I just went over and did it right now. Sitting, fitting, sitting there. Anyway, um, I removed about 35 wires from the rear half of the car. So almost enough to make speaker play. Yeah, it's basically this is what happens when Jeff says, I mean, "There's a lot of extra wires back here." And then you leave me alone for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean that. Like someone should take days. And he's like, what is this? And Chris is like, damn it. I'm damn it. I don't out. know what that is immediately. I must remove it. I did. 
because there's lots of wires in the back. So anyway, uh, massive amounts of them are done. They're all because I had the entire back half of the car harness out of the car, stripping wires out. He opens the, the door and was like, look at how much I took out. And it was just like, I took very, these wires out. And that was half very of big pile. But I deep pinned the connectors that they came out of. So it's a good clean D and did, did you use my little, my little oh, wish totally. purchase? Yeah, of course. So mental, you don't, you might not know this on wish. I bought a I'm little gonna, key ring. I'm going to stop you right there. Cause I bought the exact same thing because <laughs> marketing on Instagram has so weaponized. I'm like, yeah, I need that for seven bucks. I also have a, uh, now I have a wheel, uh, the, the wheel bolt pattern measurer at, you know, for six oh. bucks. Why wouldn't I employ some Chinese kid like that and send it to? And you, you buy it in one in one month, and you get it seven months later. Exactly, exactly. Yes. And, and then it's do like I wrapping your own? It's like wrapping your own Christmas presents or hiding do, your own Easter eggs. I mean, the, the best part is, is do I know how to use this tool, or do I have any intention of using this tool? This keychain of D pinners. No, I take it over to Chris's house and I go, "Hey, Chris, look what I got. I'm just going to leave this in your toolbox." My thing is, is for the. For the price of these, and this is in counter to our thing, but for the price of some of these tools, the one time I need it, I'm going to be glad I spent the seven bucks on it. I'm going to spend an hour looking for it, but I'll be glad that I had it. Mental when there's two clips and a wiring harness, and Chris says, just unplug that. I go like this for like 10 minutes. I'm like, that's that's how by do nature. I do it? And he comes that's over by goes, nature with, of all the cars with, that like the cars we work in are all old and, and neglected. With and, with one hand, he sticks three fingers in. He goes, and it comes apart. He is the, he is the kung fu wiring harness master. Anyway, Chris, what else did you do on that damn 300ZX? All that wiring that I took apart, I then reloomed and taped and secured with P clips to various parts of the car to make sure it's not going to go anywhere and it doesn't get in our way. I even loomed the power wire to the cool shirt cooler pump in Ooh. the stock harness all the way around the car. So it's Ooh. a good, again, a very clean install. Very cool. Probably going for any of us that have ever actually had to like emergency rewire the a cool shirt cooler that's a great that is proper because one a crappy one one, one, one good one good turn and you've disconnected the cool yeah. shirt so that's all that's all in there nicely well our cool shirt pump now is attached to the car not the cooler so the the, the pump is hard mounted so then we'll run lines to the cooler anyway um, I also have the getting the dash back together right now I'm actually like trying to find the hardware and the buckets of Z parts that we have um, getting the interior <laughs> buttoned up and I found three broken studs on the oil pan for no reason whatsoever. I'm so mad at this. So I have now ordered and received a reverse thread drill bits because I got to get those damn things out. I'm hoping that the oh. reverse thread drill will walk it back out. Very fortunately, the three that are broken are like the th only three accessible ones on the motor. And so this I is can the actually get a drill. Super, yeah, this is the super sexy. Yeah. And then re-engineered oil we don't know how these things broke like they they're studs they go in the block and like i barely I, touched them with and, the and i bought them from summit these aren't like chinese yeah. like Chinese. well they are still parts. chinese yeah, but, yeah you know what i mean but i barely touched them with the ratchet and like so which tells me they were already broken i don't know how anyway so now i have to drill these studs out and put some bolts in that sucks Yes. Yeah. Uh, Lying we, under the car, drilling out broken bolts is everyone's one of everyone's least favorite jobs. We saved the stock bolts if you wanted to find them. They're in there somewhere. In I a found some bag. that work. I mean, okay. in all the. No, I have a Ziploc bag that has oil pan bolts. OK, I'll look for that, too. Well, I'm not going to. Yeah, I will work on it. When you're hey, you know what? Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it when we get there. Great. Thanks. Uh, anyway, that's what I've been doing. Like the car is actually getting properly close in a variety of ways but still so much there's so much so many little things to do mm -hmm. i'm excited and i can't wait for you to come back from your lovely vacation i wish you well and hope you do not get the runs or the covid so that i can get back Thank there you. and keep working it's very nice of you and uh if, if i'm not mistaken i was about to yell news and notes mental well, and, 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 which is why i want to get in there um, what, uh, what, what is driving this particular vacation you two are taking? Getting away. Good time. One oh, of the best days of the year. 
<laughs> yep. It is that time of the year, yep. dear listeners, where almost every week we'll be celebrating a birthday. Three fourths of this podcast has a birthday all in the same like two week period. Yeah. And then yours is Mine's like a week out. Not that far away. Yeah. yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> it's birthday Whatever. season, everyone. News and notes. Send all your right. gift cards to everyone.racers at gmail.com. That's right. Uh, so, as well. so here's a question. If you are playing a state lottery, a state backed lottery, and it's like a scratch off and you are going to win a brand new Corvette and like money on the hood, so to speak, to pay for all the taxes and stuff. What do you, exp if you scratch it off and you win Chrissy, what do you think you're going to get? A Barbie car? No, this is real Corvette. Okay, I thought you asked me what what size of the car that I'm expecting no. to receive. Do do you expect to get a car? Uh, like you scratch off in three Corvettes, you win a Corvette. You win a Corvette, a Corvette, and fifteen thousand dollars. I'm hesitant, obviously. Hmm. This is a so, state lottery. This isn't some crazy like you know. Uh, probably not. Know. I'm gonna. I'm expecting a Barbie car. Well, probably I, I because. Expect I expect the amount of money that a Corvette costs. And they say, here's some money, which we suggest you use to buy a Corvette. Well, this is exactly what this guy won. And I'm going to open the story here because, well, there's an update. So let's just get right to the update. Georgia man, he won $250,000, which is supposed to be a Corvette and whatever, whatever the less of the money was. And they said the, the value of the Corvette is X dollars. And here's the amount of dollars to go buy it. And he said, Bullshit. I can't get a Corvette for that much. Keep that cash and bring me a Corvette that someone will actually sell me for sticker. Well, and that was part of the problem is every dealer went, we're not selling you a Corvette. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I got, sticker a, I got price. a waiting list. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that that's what happened. And then, Mental, you found the update. Uh, there actually was, uh, thanks to the Internet, an Atlanta dealer who stepped up to the plate and said, you know what? This is bullshit. You should have a Corvette. Come get one. I got a blue one for you at sticker price. Yep, that's nice. Yep, we should call out the dealership's name. It is. Where is it? Sorry, I, I, I didn't know you'd go that deep. Is I the master? Oh, what the master Chevrolet in Aiken, South Carolina? Uh, no, that it is it a... master Chevrolet in Aiken, South Carolina? Exactly. Look not even a Georgia dealer. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I said Georgia dealer. I was wrong. The man was from Georgia. No, no, no. Yeah, but it was a Georgia. You were it right. was a Georgia lottery. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it was a Georgia lottery and a Georgia man who won it, but a South Carolina dealer. Thank you. Who stepped up the plate? Good luck with your Corvette, dude. And uh, yeah, so if you if you are you a Corvette, you want this dealer? There you go. Master Chevrolet, Aiken, South Carolina, not too far away from Carolina Motorsports Park, where you could exercise that Corvette. All right. Oh, cool. NBC has decided they're going to shut down the sports network known as NBC SN. Uh, why do you care? Well, as Kristen Shaw tells us over at the drive, that means if you watch NASCAR, IMSA, or the IndyCar races, you're going to have to go beyond cable, which means you're going to have to fork out some money for a streaming service. Uh, to make it worse, they're segmenting the coverage. So if you want IndyCar, you have to subscribe to the Peacock Premium, which is five bucks a month. But if you live overseas or in Mexico or South America, and there are no South Americans or Europeans running IndyCar. No, uh, none. Yeah, yeah. Well, screw you because IndyCar and Peacock don't care and you can't get it. Uh, and you like IMSA? Well, that's a whole different subscription. That's going to be NBC Sports Track Pass Gold for another $5 a month or just $3 if you just want to skip the NASCAR routes and ARCA coverage in American Flat Track. And to date, the destination of the NBC. SN's car culture shows like Proving Grounds or Caffeine and Octane or the Mecham Auto Auctions. They have no idea where that stuff's going. So uh, you know what? NBC, you're one friggin' network. You think you can figure this out? That like, kind of yeah. sucks because I've they really figured out how much to make the most money off, them, guess, off yeah. the people who care. And what they're going to find out is they're going to make the zeroest amount of money because no one's paying for that crap and they're just going to find some hacker who can get it you know, from an you know, underground pirate server but yeah, yeah they they actually were doing decent coverage i was seeing uh, a lot of european racing on there oh, uh, yeah. so that was great yeah yeah, yeah so, like formula one figured it out why can't nbc who knows they'll figure somebody will figure it out uh they have a little bit of time before racing starts uh nearly 
After nearly 40 years in U.S. showrooms, the VW Golf is no more. Uh, Wesley Wren fr- tells us from Auto Week that the golf production in Pueblo, Mex- Mexico factory will end altogether at the end of January. Uh, the lovely hatchback will continue to roll out in VW's manufacturing fi- facilities in Wolfsburg, Germany. That translates to no more U.S. spec golfs. This is sad because I owned one. This is why you gave me this story, I'm sure. Uh, inventory is projected to be to last this year. You'll still be able to get one of the performance versions like GTI or Golf R. Uh, but if you're eyeing the TSI with the four, uh, 147 horse liter, 1.4 liter turbo, now, is anybody on this channel really trying to get wait the, for like, the it? Base model, uh, right? Yes, yes, that's what everybody <laughs> wants. Uh, I have one anyway. But anyway, uh, that was my first car. Uh, six speed or this eight speed auto. No three things. First, uh, the price starts at twenty four thousand, which seems ridiculously low. Uh, it, you have to get one this year, and then three. You might be listening. You're probably listening to the wrong podcast. Yeah, exactly. True. No one's buying the base one around here. So, so just I'm not. Just I read this, but I wasn't really sure. So the base model was made in a different factory in a different country in a different the base model U.S. version. Oh, the, oh, god. The it. Wolfsburg plant's still going to be making the European versions. They're just the not bringing over the base anymore. Got it. The high performance North American versions, right? Got it. Which is awesome. fine. Because Americans like a Jetta instead of a Golf because they're dumb. Idiots. Yeah. Oops. Anyway. So the future is not in Volkswagen Golfs. The future is electric uh, eventually, as we know. Um, as many automakers are proving, that's not all bad. Uh, Porsche set a world drifting record with their new entry level rear, dr- rear drive only taken. They can't. That's a take can. Okay. Anyway, now Nick Berg at Haggerty writes about the new sideways capable all electric BMW i4 study for showrooms later this year. Berg spent some time with the BMW's product lead to the an awesomely named David Alfredo Ferrufino Camacho. <laughs> Yes. Mountain Dew. Hey, for Bert. That is the exact opposite <laughs> of every name in Mental's phone book. Yes. <laughs> I've got a Camacho in there. Son. Yeah, but it's just Camacho. There's no first name. There's no last name. It's just Camacho. Right. Yep. Anyway, we got some pictures of the car drifting through the test. BMW claims 530 horsepower, zero to 16, four seconds. That's for range. They say it'll cover 370 miles on a full charge. Wow. That's like and a real live I, like sedan too. Yeah. I did actually spell that slideways on purpose. Oh, good. That's good. <laughs> Uh, I'm anyway, I all electric BMWs. Yeah, good. Yep. Upcoming races. Do we have any upcoming races? We we sort of do. I don't know. So, what happened? We do. Uh, so AER uh, just announced that this week that they are canceling the Charlotte Roval race next month. Uh, they were filling my in- email box uh, trying to get more entries. So I assume they didn't make the minimum amount of entries, and this is not COVID related. Uh, but obviously we didn't reach out and ask them because that's, they don't want to be butthurt about it. Uh, they, they did actually say this. They said, we only had 22 entries and we can't, uh, they, they said 22. Really, they, it was a really honest email. And it was like, we've only got 22 entries and I can't afford to run around like, that. so props to AER for just being straight up. Yeah. I thought that was secret inside information when you told me. That Initially earlier. it was, okay. and then they, they sent out an email to everyone saying this is the situation. All right. Well, they're hoping to reschedule. Anyway, World Racing League is running. They're 8 plus 8 at NOLA this weekend. They have 34 cars. 19 of them are BMWs. Boring. Three Miatas, one Honda, three Porsches, and an Elan NP01. And my favorite, the Guinetta G55. I so love that Guinetta. It's I have fun. no idea what an Elan, and that's a Lotus Elan? No, no, it's no, a, no. It's, a, it's the it's like a little mini Daytona prototype car with a Mazda MZR. Oh, on it. I remember that. I remember that from previous races. You know what? I I dig World Racing League for letting in some of these uh some of these prototype things. Those prototype guys, good for you. I'm not going to put my prototype on the same track with a bunch of sedans. The MP01 was actually designed to be a affordable. It's actually the same thing as G- the the Ganetta. It's supposed to be a finger quote mass market appeal high production, you know, track race car. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, they added their event at the Barber Motorsports Park in March, which is nearly sold out at 55 cars with the first 48 hour signups being open. So if you would like to see the Guineta and the NPO one yourself, why not join the world racing league down there at Barber? 
I'll say oh, okay. if, you, if you if you get a chance to go watch, depending on what their COVID rules are, that's those are gonna be some cool cars at a beautiful track. Yeah, best track in America. Did I say that? Nice, most beautiful track in America. I can say that that I've been to. One of the better, definitely all arounder tracks in the whole country. Sure. Without getting closer. It's not oh. beautiful in February, but okay. <laughs> it's not. Well, it was March. Whatever. It's still brown and cold. I got yeah. art. You could look at all the gnomes and stuff. Yeah. Sure. Reese. No, we got none of them. No. 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 Nope. No, we're good. We can do. Listen up because we have lots of that. Okay, in response to our continuing series on why engine swaps are stu- stupid, we have lots of sympathizers. Chris Egan actually sent us an email, which you can do, you could also do at everyone.racers at gmail.com. In his email, it tells us about his long engine swap project uh, into a BMW. I just want to share the intake saga of the D- Daytona powered BMW particularly his intake, which wraps around, wraps the throttle body above the bell housing and would hit the firewall of the E36. So he had to move the throttle body to the other side. This involves much cutting and welding, even before you address the intake runners inside the casting he cut apart. The tale goes on to, uh, goes to our lessons of the 80-20 rule that we keep telling you. He finishes with I should finish it someday. We, we should mention that this is a, when he says a Daytona swap, he means a 2.2 liter Chrysler Daytona motor, like a turbo two motor out of a Chrysler Daytona. This is the worst motor on the planet to put into the BMW other than That's why he's he, doing it. Other than what he suggested the first time he was going to put in this BMW, which was a 12A rotary. I think a 13B. 13B? Which, which no, I, thought he, I thought he said it was 12A. Anyway, whatever. Well, it's all rotary. Whatever. whatever. Uh, Chris all a mistake. One those, Chris Egan's one of those really smart people who does really dumb things. He, he, I think this is more of a because I could and I, he was single and like, well, <laughs> what else am I doing right now? And now it's sitting. Anyway, Michael K took exception with Mental's dismissal of GM V6. His Mental seems to have an irrational hatred of these. I'm indifferent to them personally. I Jeff love the 3800. Right. Mental is just, Mental has something to <gasps> crawl on these things. Yeah, they sound terrible, but whatever. Anyway, Michael Krenzer commented, the 3800 is not dead yet for swaps in the Midwest because they are so plentiful. I said, I can pee on three GMs in three in the GM section if I stand on the roof of any single car. Yeah, you're probably right. Uh, he added some specifics for the transmission and added the VQ was the front runner for the longest time, but the rear wheel drive transmissions were expensive and the throttle by wire with an extensively finicky ECU knocked it out of contention. Uh, if you don't want to listen to us or considering one of these 3800s, checked out his whole comment in our YouTube section. They're an okay choice. I wouldn't call them the best choice, but if you live in the Midwest and you, you get them at Walmart, that's a different story, I guess. They're very compact. They are for what they are, without that's, a doubt. That, that's and, one of the reasons I really like them. And they built them for a million years, so they kind of figured them out. And you could get them supercharged, mother effing, 200, yeah. what, 260 horsepower in that sucker? 240, yeah. 240. But then the intake points right at the throttle body or at the, at the <laughs> firewall. They need to get to cut holes in the firewall and run. No, you a- go to Australia and you buy the yeah. throttle for the one that's Even the other then. direction. I don't know. Or you cut your intake manifold apart like Chris Egan. Yeah. Anyway, don't do it. Don't uh, don't swap motors, people. It's a terrible <laughs> idea. Cool. That's your own. Over at Houston, the, when I was down there, the fine folks at Breaking Bad Racing dropped off a case of White Claws for a bribe, which shows some pretty advanced planning capability. Good on those guys. But on the YouTube, they cautioned against not planning ahead like they did with their V8-swapped E36. If you're mixing and matching LS blocks uh, and pans, pay attention to where the dipstick hole is. On some stuff, the pan is uh, it's in the pan. On others, it's on the block pick the wrong combo and you'll show up to your first race with no way to check the oil level on a rebuilt engine. This is hilarious. Which they did. Now that BMW actually did retire early for some teething issues, but surprisingly not from being blown up like Sajeev and I were absolutely convinced it was going to do. I'm rubbing my face in shock and awe. How do you not figure out that you don't have a dipstick before you get to the race? No, they figured what they, it was. It wasn't before they got to the race. It was once they had the engine in there and it was running. They're like, "All right, how much oil is in it?" 
Oh, crap. How do you not figure that out before you install the motor? And, and they just decided they weren't pulling the engine out to fix this problem. Just button it up. Guess how much oil is in there and send it. Oh, wow. <laughs> good, oh, honestly, good, good bunch of teams. They truly embrace the kind of the lemon spirit on it. And they're like, we're, we're just, we're not that deep into it to pull it back out. Although I but say if that. Just, if you drain it. And then pour five quarts in, and you go like, "Well, that's probably that's good, good enough." enough. And, yeah. and and I think I got the feeling that that was because they they with a brand new engine swap car, they knew they weren't going to be competitive, and they were just going to come there and figure out what was going to break on the car. So they they had the right attitude towards the race anyway. So I I should say because I'm the one that shopped and bought the oil pan, I did not see oil pans with dipstick options. They're all they, every, I knew our LS had the oil. I did not know that our LS had the oil dipstick in the block. Mm. I just did not see a pan that also had a dipstick. Hey, here's another thing when you're shopping for LS oil pans, if the ones that you're finding come with a uh, filter screw on right on that pan, I found out this weekend, it is not the same size or thread pitch as the normal GM thing that it oh came really off of. not necessarily oh well i think we'll talk about this in the main topic yeah so uh, <laughs> i had to order a different um sandwich plate which i got today but awesome anyway uh yep. we did have a style request in the listener feedback section uh seeing the cut job on the z randy asked please 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 keep the vtech and vortech engine cover popping out of the hood shaker hoods make oh, everything what? better <laughs> I have a VTEC engine cover downstairs. That would be funnier <laughs> if we put the 2.4 Honda Devil Cam VTEC cover. <laughs> I, I like the Vortec one, though, because it has the right kind of shape that we need so the to Honda cover. The Honda one's not too far off. And man, oh, all right. All right. Think well, about this. But well, the, and, and you're not going against his advice of shaker hoods do make everything look cooler. The, we might just have to go to the junkyard and, and find and find a couple of them. Yeah. Like the one that goes over a North Star is big. And it kind of oh. domes, <laughs> and that like I don't know. Mm. We, we're we're gonna have to work on the front because the air, making sure that the air gets into the air cleaner and goes through the radiator is gonna be the most important. Well, we still so. notch it for that. Yeah. yeah anyway. Yeah. But anyway. Um, yeah. So my brother, the good Wakeman, whoever wrote the notes, wrote the good Wakeman. Thank you. Says finally I got oh. a bingo. Anyway, Jeff. He so he's he's commenting on my car shopping and he says get the car you really want don't settle. The last two cars he purchased for me were the ones that made me really 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 want them. He also said forget front wheel drive go ahead and get a rear wheel drive car. We live in the same climate yes we live like three miles apart, um, and he never had any issue except in really deep snow and he didn't even put his snows on this year. Yeah you you didn't have any time for that. No, he didn't go anywhere. Yeah. So what happened last year, last year he didn't put his snows on either. Jim's snow tires last about as long as a box of donut holes do in front of my son. Okay. These, they, 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 he just, I have no idea why Jim, how Jim gobbles up his snow tires so quickly, but um, probably. Didn't he have them on in like June? Yeah, that's how. Because it's probably was busy. That's, that's why. That's the answer. Jeff, no, 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 no. <laughs> He always needs new tires. <laughs> like, so we always have the wrong wheels on at whatever season because he needs new tires and he hasn't ordered them yet. So, but anyway, so, I, but he's not wrong. I didn't put my snow tires on yet this year either or last year because ain't I no snow. I, I, I left my, I didn't Shut put up. any. Oh, wait, <laughs> until, until the snow comes next week. I got a truck. It's well, Vegas. We're going actually, nowhere when it snows. Actually, I could throw them on, and I probably should. Yeah. It's going to be put cold. them on the Mazda this year because don't do it for me. We had the we had the Continental ECSs, and we said, well, like if we have to go somewhere, we're not going around those. So like like we have these snow tires in the shed. They're mostly dead, but they're better than the Continentals. Well, I'm I'm kind of in the same position because although I don't run summers, I run high performance all seasons. Uh, they're getting a little a little slim so maybe i will put the snows on but anyway especially if you've gotten to the car to that point where you're at the don't give an f but i'm not ordering snow. new tires right exactly when the snow is all summer i'm not getting new tires you're not wrong why anyway. does jeff sound like phil 
because he's getting okay. excited about stuff. Okay, but just making I sure. I am. I'm a bit shut out of a cannon tonight. Yeah. I suck at racing. I racing report. Speaking of things to get excited about, great news. Since I racing is back. Nate Schlavine has announced the start of the 2021 season one. He's redoing the naming uh, next month. So if you've not done one of these virtual races, head over to I suck at racing, all one word.com and get signed up. The link is in our show notes, uh, along with Nemesis labs, top flight computers. And of course, Ryan, AKA bearded sim racer, his YouTube broadcast channel. And no the- one okay. pumps a category like mental without a doubt. <laughs> he can chill with the best of them. As in the past, the series will alternate between trash races and the Doros. Planned tracks include Watkins Glen, Long Beach. Oh, I'm excited for Long Beach. And for the first time, they're going to Long Beach. And another key party race, which is, of course, cool. And maybe I'll get into this one. I don't know. Uh, the return to the no pedal, no wheel has provided some great innovation in the past, including the dog-powered entry. What was the dog's name? Anybody remember? Buster. Buster. Uh, a French horn and multiple airplane rudders. Uh, Phil wanted an etch a sketch, and I still think that's the way to go. <laughs> okay, I was trying to figure out what Chris was doing, drawing on a screen. That's how they. That's how they. That's how um, you get the dog to look up. The dog. You oh, hold the, oh, the treat. Dog looks up, looks down. Like Shoot. you hold the treat to make, let make the dog look certain directions. All right. So some uh, most of these are going to be Sunday night events, as they have been before. But the opener will be just in in just over a week next Thursday, February fourth is the season premiere with the Lemons Eye Racing Circus heading to Long Beach for the Enduro. Uh, even if it's not your type of racing, tune in on YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and keep up with the great live broadcast, which is usually favorite some of your favorite people. Favorite. Wow. Not, none of like us, obviously. Fine. Okay. Podcast host. Like Terry Gross. <laughs> <laughs> that would be Actually, amazing. Mark Aaron, Terry Gross. They're going to get on there and go, what, what, what is Mooshlong? Why, why am I yeah. here? All right. So yeah, Terry Gross, Ira, <laughs> Ira, Ira Glass, Glass, Ira Ira Glass. Glass. and uh, Mark Roman Barrett. Mars. They're all right. Yes. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> or not. Oh, well. Or funnier. Hey, you know, if you're if you want to race in something that's even worse than the Lemons events, hey, you can run with us. We do laugh a lot though. Like this last Monday, we had a pair of races at one of our favorite iRace venues. It's the Irwindale figure eight with the jump, because why you would run it without the jump, I don't know. I mean, the jump just made a jump great awesome. track. Uh, it, jump it's like great. it's there's, like icing on your Sunday. There's it's, a little <laughs> less crashing with the jump and without the jump i don't i but don't the crashes so. are way more spectacular <laughs> without right. the jump you get, some, you get some fun crashes too like when you bounce off the roof of something but still land like yeah the, those are good anyway hilarity and lots of fast pairs ensued we had the, the first race was completely inappropriate cars from every class and i really actually tried to weed out the cars that break after going over the jump two or three times you know which is which is a lot of them actually. So um, the ones that were left were, were, were durable enough. Like, and what did we have in there? We had the AMG. We had the Legends. The, Legends uh, are the best for that. They are. They are. The That's they what I used. They bounce. What Miatis, else do we have in there? Uh, MX5. Uh, oh, I had that NASCAR uh, one, fusion in there. Yeah, the fusion. Uh, one guy had the fusion the whole time. He just talked about how terrible it Corey, was. Corey, Corey had the uh, yeah, I can't remember who was. I'd like um, to point out that both the aliens took the AMG. There was one person that took. Do you have a Skippy in there? Oh, we yeah, have no. We had an open wheel in that in there. Yep. The so people yeah, cars jumping break? always seems fun. Yeah. No, they're durable because they're made for people like Tom, like Mino and I who crash them. <laughs> I mean, it did flip a lot, but they all yeah. flip a lot. Well, I, I made it for the second race, so I was glad to, you know, I, the mouse and, that and one the, was, the stove had been all repaired. Yeah. The, the mouse second trap race was, was set. Was rally cars? Uh, yeah, we had so a bunch of different rally cross cars and the Pro Twos, all cars that could kind of take a jump. So these could just keep going over the jump, but they would crash into other things. But a lot of fun, similar outcome though. But you know, good. To, oh, we could put the 87s in there too, which Lamina was the only one dumb enough to do that and is tied 87. <laughs> <laughs> and just listening to Dave and Tom go at each other is, is worth the effort right there. It's great. Yeah. Oh yeah. Both races had a pretty good turnout. So yeah, we had yeah. 21 people in the second race. Yeah. To show up. I was wondering Solid how many, it, it was a great time and a lot of folks are there. Yeah. That was just fantastic. And the Irwindale is always good for, to test your stomach when you're using VR. I always say, <laughs> Oh, I can't, I love this. And I get out and I'm like almost actually throwing up. 
Yep. You just got to close your eyes. And once you start to go upside down, I do, I do. Uh-huh. <laughs> now, you know, who never closes her eyes when she goes upside down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. Neither do I, but it sounds good. Chrissy's mom, I bet. Yep. Yes. Hi, Chrissy's mom. Cool. Oh. Dad. Hi, Chrissy's mom and dad and sister oh. and brother-in-law. Yeah, and whoever's listening whoever these else days. Is listening. We don't even know. Absolutely. I can say hi to my brother sometimes since he seems to be listening. Now they're on YouTube. No, no, no. Hi, Jeff's brother. brother. Your and, brother and, watches, watches. Yeah, yeah, watches. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and we still seem to every now and then get a comment on the YouTube from uh, from uh, our boy Omar. And we didn't put him on the on the. Uh, we, we should mention that Mental uploaded a different video. He uploaded the video to our YouTube for the re- wrap up of New Hampshire. And Omar was very distraught that the Civic is busted. He got to the end. He said it was like it made him like cry a little. That Not just Omar, but uh, Dean also of Sorry for Party fame did not realize that the Civic was dead. Yeah. So yeah, no, I, and, and I apologize. Uh, it took me so long because I'm fighting with uh, some video editing software. So, but we're, we're hoping to do a lot more of that kind of nonsense on our YouTube channel. Well, we're, we're trying to learn, I think really is what yeah, it is. We absolutely, so. we are. So, and once Michael's uh, not moving everything in his house into <laughs> one room, also well, might help. The interesting thing is, is when I uploaded that video, I got to do, uh, YouTube said, would you like to do a live premiere? Yeah, okay, sure. <clears throat> so I did a, a live premiere and um, our super fans, James Mulhern and Jason Hopkins watched it with me while I live premiered it, I think. on so- and, and I actually got some good suggestions for software, but they all really enjoyed it and they appreciated it. So if, uh, if you haven't been over to our YouTube, even if you don't like watching the show on YouTube, you can watch our wrap-up video. There's a, my my first favorite is still the uh, the argument between Matt and Bruce. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Not safe for work, by the way, that no, one. But, no, no, yeah. no. <laughs> Cr- Chrissy, do you, do you know what kind, there are two kinds of student films. Are you aware of this? No, enlighten me. Long and way too long. <laughs> Shorten each edit. Shorten each edit. That's my. That's my. All right. Okay. Very topic time. It's we're still talking about engine swaps, bad ideas, and this is why engine swaps are dumb. Part three of what is still not finished. This is a multi-part series. Now, we know you didn't listen to our advice on this, and that's not surprising. We tell you not to listen to us. On the topic, this topic, especially though, you're going to want to catch this episode because this is all things we've learned from doing it wrong, making our mistakes. Last week, we were thinking about this series, and we realized that all of our current three pedal mafia, active or in progress cars, all have motor swaps. Now, the D16 Civic was stock plus and ran for years with no issues. With 33 races on that motor, Chris, the Hero motor? Something like that. Yeah. Uh, it was well supported in, in a lot of stuff. But then uh, when we did the custom to the K24, it needed some work and some teething issues. But then it dominated kind of for a while. And we want to race with it. The Z is well, the Z is miles into the full custom camp. Cressida is stock plus and is still the most successful car in three pedal mafia history. Betty and the TR7 are both deep into that custom category and they are spectrums of success because everything that Betty has done right, the TR has done so, so very wrong. Yeah. Uh, and, And as much as I love Betty, every time you climb into the TR, you're like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done. And by the end of it, you're, you're a laughing because you love, yeah. you love the TR when it's running. And what motor was in the TR seven, Chris? It's cause, you're, it's cause you're flying so close to death that you just start, like, <laughs> you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to die. I have never been more certain of my impending injury than I was driving that car in the rain at Pittsburgh. Yes. Yes. It is. It is it's literally a- the only time I have ever been in a race car going, what the hell am I doing right now? <laughs> That's why I didn't get in it. Cause I was like, if you guys are getting out of it saying I'm not doing that again. I'm like, why am yeah. I going to get in? I'm going to die. For, for those okay. of you who think the 3,800 does not sound good. Just get the one with the supercharger and the blown muffler. Because when that goes, <laughs> and the car twists sideways, and that supercharger he starts. Yes, you, you're going down the straight is exciting. 
But even even the Mazda that is coming this year, which by the way, congratulations, Chrissy. We all saw your post. Fantastic. Thank you. Two hundred fifty thousand miles. To the moon. She she bought that car new, and the very first time I ever met Chrissy, she arrived in that car. And then she had known me for two days and had to drive me to the airport the, that following Monday. Um, it is all it is it is already a stock plus swap, and it's going to stay that way. So as we get deeper into the series, we're, we're spending more and more time talking about the custom stuff because you don't need to worry about this stuff with the stock plus because most of those problems have been figured out. So stick to those. If you're if you're going with the engine swap, go with like you know the the coyote in your fox body kind of a deal. Don't go with a 5.3 and two way Z32. Yes, yeah. that was a lot of letters and numbers smushed together. <laughs> but everyone knows. Everyone oh, knows. okay. Okay. All right. So after the last episode, if you're following along, which we hope you were, uh, you actually have the basic long block and trans mounted to the car. Yeah, right. Congratulations. Uh, if you do, you're now 20% of the way done. Uh, and most of the stop swaps stop right here. Uh, let's we're going to talk about all the stuff that hangs off the motor and makes it work. Let's start with oiling and then get the air out of the engine. And we have plenty more, plenty, plenty more to cover yeah. in future episodes. We're only yeah. doing oil. Oh, yes. Yes. We got a long way to go in this series. So sorry. I don't know. <laughs> So whether you're racing with your swap or not, every engine needs to have a quality oiling system. <clears throat> you get to make sure the right oil is flowing the right way with the right flow and pressure and temperature. And if you got enough oil in the right places at the right times, and it's a lot of rights, but it's true. So this is going to be a discussion on oiling systems that can apply to non-swaps too. It's just going to just be your, your stock car can benefit from all this stuff. So um, last time we talked about picking the right oil pan. So we're going to assume you're okay there. Um, same for the oil pump and pickup because they usually go together and a lot of modern motors have the oil pump as part like, or as, as on the end of the crank. That's fine. Um, so we're going to leave that. One word on pickups though. Make sure you didn't dent your pan putting it on or putting the motor in and out a bunch of times. <clears throat> Ask our TR crew about how many 3800s they blew up because the pickup was too close to the dented pan. And when it got to higher RPMs, it couldn't get enough oil and sucked air and spun bearings. So and, and you say that as if they dented it accidentally. No, these were some purposeful dents to make sure it fit around yeah. the cross member. Either so way. this is, this is self-inflicted. Be careful. Wounds. Either way, be careful. This kind of stuff matters. Um, <clears throat> so, you're, you know, for some cars, the stock oil pump is going to be enough. <clears throat> Most of them are fine. Um, some cars, you, porting them helps um, get so the oil can flow at higher RPMs without cavitation. The return passages, porting those can help sometimes. But all, all this is, you know, and that along with baffles too. Baffles are always good if they are done properly. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> That's a different show. So for your stock at swap, you need a filter as big as possible in an accessible location. You need a way to cool the oil because endurance racing is murder on temperature in everything. And this will help you uh, and lines to make it all flow around. If you have the room, a sandwich plate oil fill adapter is the easy button. Now this goes between your, where you put the oil filter and the filter itself and kind of spaces it out an inch and a half or so to allow room for the oil to flow in and out before it goes to the filter. So it, it's really easy. It just screws on most of the time. You just want to make sure it doesn't put your filter like into something, like into a firewall or a cross member. The ground. Or it make it, right. It does, or it doesn't make it hang two inches below everything else. So that's the first thing it's going to hit. If you, if you, one of your teammates happen to put two wheels off track, they're going to tear a filter off. That's a bad idea. So these sandwich plates usually have NPT ports coming in and out of them try to find one that has half inch NPT ports. that's going to flow enough. So we, I saw a lot when I was looking recently for this, it had three eights NPT ports and that's not enough to flow all of the motor oil for your whole car. It's just not going to work that way. Mental. Yes. Now, kits do they offer the ability or have I misread this where you, you can start using a more common oil oil filter, something that get at or an O'Reilly's or. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to touch on that at the end of the section that I'm talking about right now. So good timing. Anyway, um, for hoses out of those NPT ports, you're, you just want to go right to A on stuff with proper hose ends. 
we've tried rubber hoses and clamps, like stuff that comes with the, uh, you know, the, the relocation kits and stuff, you know what? And we almost lost the motor, almost oiling down the track. If Chrissy weren't astute and picked up on it real quick and got right off the track into the grass, great job on her part she saved the motor and saved oiling down a whole bunch of track so which was every that? everybody uh, in new hampshire people, new hampshire, new hampshire. which car Civic. oh okay because we had the barbs on the boat for a long yeah. time yeah and but that wasn't issues yeah that that was like a variation luck. of the stock thing and luck and right all the entire oil of the car wasn't flowing through that like with the civic all of the oil out of the pump was flowing through that thing yeah, so yeah. um Anyway, it, you know, do your do your competitors and yourself a favor and spend the couple dollars on the better stuff to avoid any kind of breaking situation there. The the AN line kits on Amazon these days actually seem decent so far and they're priced very favorably. I, I thought they were cheap. I yeah, compared to buying all the stuff individually, it's it's a deal. Yeah. The the kits were so great I bought them twice. Oh good. Well, <laughs> no, the wrong we, ones, remember? Oh, that's the relocation. You said get a relocation kit. kit. I bought one, and then like a year later, you're like, "We need a relocation kit." I bought another one, and then we looked at both of them, and you said, "Nah, I think I want a sandwich plate." Yeah, exactly. Anyway, it is the uh, I I, when I said kits, I meant the A N line kits. Yes, you just bought that. that, You bought an A N ten line kit that came with six fittings and six feet of hose and it was reasonably priced for for what you got it's actually cheaper it was basically you're buying the fittings and getting the hose for free which is that's a deal so give it a shot uh fittings in a little bit so yeah so what else everybody if if your filter just doesn't fit then you're going to need an actual relocation kit we started talking about a little bit that puts your filter somewhere else than where the factory put it and sometimes it's really hard to find a good accessible location where you can actually get to the filter and change it and not make a tragic mess every time you do it. Like one of the Honda is, is kind of over by the transmission on the driver's side and it's the best spot I could find. And I still have to take a piece of tin foil and bend a little trough to get the oil to not land on the splitter and things every time we change it, which it's not tragic, but there could be much, much worse places. We in in the to- old Honda, didn't it like land right on top of the transmission? From the relocator. Yeah, it, was, it was similar to what this yeah. was. It was on the other side because the engine's on their side. It was it was basically again that you had to get the 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 paper the tinfoil trough to make it work. Um, but doing this though, when you do an oil filter relocation, usually lets you use a big ass filter like the one we have. We've got that big giant Ford V8 style that was on every five liter F-150. So that alone adds half a quart of capacity right there and a lot of filtration media. So if you can do it, it's, it's a nice way to go because it gets you extra filtration and maybe an easier oil change. So yeah, nice. It's, uh, it's a lot there. I promise to talk about uh, the, the AN fittings and stuff, but I do want to mention the, the, what we got with the kit and what it came with. Uh, it came with six different ends, two straight, two 45s yeah. and two nineties, right? And they yep. were all AN10, and I think it was seven feet of hose, six feet of hose. I can't remember how much hose was in it. Yeah, it was a like lot. That. It was, I think, it was ten feet. So two yep. five. And it was foot the sections. fabric, fabric covered, but braided stuff, and it wasn't quite as strong as the real, like the completely solid outer braided stuff, but it's way better than any rubber hose. And it was under a hundred bucks. <clears throat> Yeah. I think it was like 88 or something like that. So I thought it was a really damn good price. Yeah. Uh, just got it right off of Amazon. Yeah. Um, so anyway, anybody that, knows where to get miles of hose for under $100. It's a guy it's, that works at a college. You know, that's right. We yeah. have all the hose. Uh, and that, fabric, anyway. that fabric outer casing actually made it easier to work on in Chris, putting Chris, the fittings together. Just, just ignores the jokes and keeps talking technical stuff. It's okay. I, I heard the joke. <laughs> People can laugh and then they can still learn something. Screw you. <laughs> Anyway, but to you, seriously, half half inch NPT fittings for the relocation kit are great. You need the half and half, but you also need like a lot of adapters. And I'm just going to tell you right now, this adapter stuff, we're going to use a lot of terms. You don't know what it is. The first time you do it, you're going to screw up. You're going to buy the wrong fittings. It's going to happen. You got to return them. It's a pain in the ass. That's why you don't do engine swaps, everybody. But make sure you get NPT to AN adapters. We're going to need the separate AN hose ends. Uh, not the AN hoses that thread to the NPT adapters because they're well, a lot harder to disconnect, right, Chris? I'm, I'm going to explain this because Jeff didn't read this ahead of time to be familiar with it to read the I copy. Did read it anyway. So the 
I didn't get it. Got, okay. When you've got the half hitch NPT, they make hose ends that go right on the hose that thread into the NPT. Yes. But I'm then aware you've got to back it all the way out of the NPT f- fitting and it takes a long time and it doesn't work very well. Where if you just get an, an NPT to A an adapter that stays in the relocation kit or in the, the, the you know, filter block up plate, whatever you're going to use. And then you use a, just a, a, a N hose end which the swivel uh, end yeah, that, and that comes off sense. that comes off much more easily so yeah. just d- d- use that don't get the an hoses that thread into the npt got it which we actually used i think in the boat and then transferred them in sizes and they were really pain in the ass yeah don't, don't do, do that. that yeah learn from our mistakes that's the whole point of this whole series is don't do the things we learn not to do the hard way got it uh yeah so anyway for oil coolers you're going to need one obviously you're putting all this up there to get into a cooler bigger typically is better uh to a point there's some diminishing returns you don't want a system that's so big your pump can't can't get it through um stacked plate is better than tube and fin style uh, if you don't know what stack plate versus tube and fin style is uh there was actually a good donut media uh video on it not too long ago they're turbo charging their uh their their miata and a, and a great thing but anyway so yeah tube and fin style the more little fins between the tubes the more the clear the, the more the cooling is generally obviously their size and things like that but so so that the more the denser it is between those tubes the better so uh when you're measuring make sure that you account for the hose ends and the fittings and you're going to have extra fittings so you really need to make sure you get a size as big as possible but that also is going to fit your front end so you got to really plan these out um we, we Chris already mentioned it, but get a cooler that already has the size AN fittings that you need. We already said we're going 10 AN, so get a cooler that has 10 AN fittings out because you're going to save so much money and space. Seriously, the first system that we built together, the one that I already mentioned in the boat, which had the push on ends, we, we learned a lot of lessons like don't use push on ends. Um, there were so many different fittings between the cooler and the first set of tubes, first set of hoses. I spent more on fittings than we did for everything else B- because we had to go from one size down to the next. It was, yeah, get the right size from the very first and then you won't have to do so much. Um, this needs to all be mounted where there's good airflow, both in and out. You're going to have to use some ducting in here. You're really going to have to uh, make sure it doesn't, get in the radiators way, but it's got to be there. Um, so if you have room at a better place, you could move it away from the radiator. So we did this in the Civic. We actually had it in the headlight bucket for years and years uh, because we also had an intercooler up there. So we kind of ran out of space in front of the radiator. But when you stack these things together, if the air first has to move through an air to air intercooler, it's going to get hot. And then if it has to move through an oil cooler, it's going to get hotter again. And then it's going to hit your radiator at a higher temperature than it started coming in. So you're going to end up having engine cooling problems. So you got to spread all that stuff out if you can. Does that make sense? Did I explain that well enough? I hope so. Uh, Okay, so you got to mount it securely, but you're going to have to remove it because it's a serviceable item. You're going to have to have leaks. You're going to have to move that radiator. You're going to have to move that air dam when you take a, you know, fist or a wheel into the front grill which is inevitably going to happen so um yeah it, it, anything can happen chris you pulled some serious stuff out of the grill of the civic over the years um how much grit how much just deteriorates how much stuff ends up getting in those front ends everything <laughs> especially if you have good ducting you collect uh, small woodland creatures um, an entomologist home case of insects. Uh, peasants. Sometimes you collect peasants. Uh, l- l- surprisingly large rocks. Um, and, <laughs> but, but never wiring harnesses that don't belong to your car. They actually don't uh, funny, 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 funny. <laughs> I'm sorry I suggested it. Um, no, but I, I wanted you to touch on the, the, the honeycomb stuff because we talked about it before, but yeah. I still don't know what, like what search term did you get that from? What is it from? Because it was way superior to the chicken wire we were using in the past. All right. So uh, side story. On the GRM board there, that's Grassroots Motorsports Forum for those who are, sorry, haven't heard this before. Um, there is an actual air, motorsports aerodynamicist on that board 
who will happily answer any amateur questions about stuff. And they even have an aerodynamics forum that he moderates to help out with this. Someone was talking about radiator protection one day and talking about with gears and chicken wire and stuff like that. And he's saying, well, the bigger the holes, the better the flow. Um, but also, so, but the, the further away from the radiator, the protection is the, the more disruption it is for the aerodynamics, for the air actually flowing through. So he said, you want ideally whatever's protecting your radiator to be up against it because then it doesn't have a chance to change it. So he suggested a honeycomb mesh. So, and if you buy this stuff, it, I got it on Amazon. I think I just searched radiator mesh and I found it. And it's, it's this honeycomb stuff. It's about half an inch, three quarters of an inch thick. And it's kind made of, of some plasticky, kind of, right? It's, it's like a like plasticky a... fiberglassy, something like that. And you just put it up against the radiator and it's straight, like straight honeycomb voids going toward the radiator. So when the air hits it, it straightens it out to go right through the radiator and has no place to go between the, the mesh and the radiator. Um, so it, it really has the least impact on flow. And it gives you an impact cushion because if it hits this stuff, this stuff has enough space to actually deform and absorb the energy of various assorted debris that is hitting the radiator. According to this, uh, on my Amazon link here, I did honeycomb radiator protector. It came up. Uh, it's Nomex. Okay, great. Yeah. I don't even know what it is, but it wasn't that expensive. Yeah. Like uh, yeah, it's like twenty two ninety nine on Speedway yeah. Motors. It's not that expensive and it's not that hard to cut with just a sharp utility knife. And you put it on with those through the radar radiator zip tie kind of things, which the only purpose those have in life is the, is for this. Like don't use them to mount an oil cooler. Don't use them on a fan because they put too much stress on the cooling fins of your radiator. But for this stuff, which has no stress to it at all, use this stuff. This stuff's great. Yeah. It's awesome stuff. Thank you. I think and, that's and, the end of my section. And we've tested the durability of that stuff. We've, we've taken some serious kind of hits to some of our coolers. It's Nomex, yo. Yeah. It's probably fireproof. Now, <clears throat> wait a minute, wait a second. Let me, let me place an order. Hey, Bill, figure out what that stuff is. <laughs> Get on it. We have plenty. Last time I did that, he brought me lunch. That's true. He got <laughs> you nachos. All the nachos. <laughs> All the nachos. Now, AN lines are a challenge in and of themselves. And if you're not completely familiar with what that was what or what that is, there is a link in our show notes. They are Army-Navy fittings, and it is a specific set of measurements. You know what that stands for? I never knew. Yep. Uh, honestly, I didn't either until I was on one of uh, Lemon's uh, white elephant list, and someone sent me one of Carol Smith's early 70s books about measurements and fittings and how to mail order different ones because it's very outdated but that's where i learned that but we've got a link to that and also apt which is american pipe thread we've got a discussion of both of those in our show notes and it kind of just breaks down what those measurements are we're talking about a and lines though now those are they're a pain just accept that and there's some tutorial videos that we'll watch and I can't really describe those very well. Uh, and then there's specialty tools that we don't have, but check out those specialty tools. And this also goes into our fuel cell episode. So before you order expensive fittings, you need to get everything hard mounted and then run just some kind of rubber hose in the proposed location to see what angle hose end you're gonna need and how long that hose will need to be to satisfy your needs, giggity. Get a full layout planning before you start buying stuff because this stuff is expensive. It's a pain in the ass to work with. We like Summit. They've got good shopping tools for the hose ends and it narrows down to those many, many choices. Amazon also has some really good prices, uh, not just for the stuff Jeff was looking for, but for all of this. For measuring, you're going always, always leave a little bit extra than you initially think you as you are going to have to make more than one cut as you get used to fitting those AN lines. Chrissy, how'd that work out on those heater hoses the other day? That's exactly what I was just thinking. Like, <laughs> never leave near, no more. More than you think you need because you don't want to cut twice do you Chris, no hey, cut just cut like it three feet she measures three feet i she measured it like eight ten times and it was still too short so yeah i, just I, I guarantee i guarantee your measurements were exactly precise we just weren't accounting for you know 
nope, nope. That, oh, I was just wrong. Yeah, you know, right. So you do all that now in, in secure, you're going to want to secure those hoses, even if it's just using zip ties, because things will start to rub. You've got abrasions. They'll get caught on stuff. Oil is really important. And when it leaks, it is really messy. A number of years ago, when I had my second 911, I lost a clutch line because somewhere in the ownership of that car, they had run the hydraulic line for the clutch outside of where it should have gone. And over the course of the six months that I had the car, it rubbed through and I completely lost my clutch coming home one night. And it's, it's, and it dumped frigging hydraulic fluid all over all the hot bits on the backside of my engine, which did it was smoking. Luckily it didn't catch on fire. Just secure the hose as much as possible. Make sure it doesn't rub on anything. You don't want to know how much a pallet of oil dry cost when you oil down the entire track in every when you walk through the paddock after oiling down the whole track and you think that everyone's looking at you going oh my god that's the one that's the one to oil down the whole track we, they we are. are we are they looking at you. Are. we are we are judging you and we're judging you badly and then you screw the track for the whole weekend even after the oil dry even worse if it's raining. You, you know what it costs for that pallet of oil dry? Like an hour of freaking track time out of all of our freaking lives. Never, it end, the, That's the, what it costs. The race yeah. ends at the same time every time. So even yeah. if you're off for an hour. Anything slippery. If you guys did not watch Houston MSR video, there was a, an Audi that was leading class and, and a car dumped a bunch of slippery stuff on the track, recognized it, turned off the, the, the Audi still ended up the firewall. So Anything that makes stuff greasy, secure that, take care of that. That's, that's what I've got. And we're going to be talking about uh, the other hot stuff that comes out of the car. Let's talk about headers and manifolds. So you have got, at, when this car is going to run, you're going to have some hot exhaust and it's going to need to get out of the engine. Oh yeah, it's going to be it, hot, baby. It's going to be hot. And it needs to not hit anything else in the engine bay because you're trying to keep that all cool, right? And it has to, you want to make sure you know where that is, exhaust is actually going to go. So fit is going to be your number one concern. Things that you're going to need to check are uh, for the from the engine, the distance to other stuff, and all the other stuff. And chances are some of the other stuff may not be installed yet because you right now, you probably only have an engine in trans in your car. So you have to think about all the other things that might be going into your car. Uh, and then you're gonna need to look the location and angle of the collector output. So figure out where all the stuff is gonna go. So your first choice is tubular headers or cast iron manifolds. Uh, manifolds are heavier, they're cheaper, more dur usually more durable. And uh, they also usually have heat shields, which are excellent to avoid crisping other things in your engine bay. So look at the available options for your motor to see if any of them was, are gonna work first. Check car part, uh, char car dash part com. I feel like sometimes we mess up these uh, pages. URLs. Yes, uh, but and see what fits and what's around and what, what is already going to work for your car. Uh, follow, for example, uh, there are about 20, different LS manifolds and some of them even flow decently so don't rule them out and uh, like for the Mazda we're using an early Mazda 6 manifold as it's almost tubular four into one header yeah th Chris and I were talking for a little bit about hey Chris, ooh, Chris ooh, which, which manifold should I buy I, I'm, I'm, I'm the, I'm the uh, tell me what to buy guy and uh, we, were, we were looking at them all on the internet and it's it's really hard to tell from an internet posting what exactly all the angles are and how tight they are to the block. And so you really, this is where doing a known swap or a, 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 a plus, a swap plus will help you out because other people have put that car in your car and can say, oh yeah, the CTSV ones fit or the Cadillac ones fit or, you know, go get the Mazda 6 ones like Chrissy just mentioned. Mentally you had your hand up. Yeah, mentally you had your hand up. Uh, heat shields also are an excellent place to rub things. Uh, there was an old lemons penalty that we were subject oh, yeah. to rub things. of rubbing of rubbing cheese on your oh, no, heat don't shield do that. so that, that your car stank for the rest of the weekend. It was so bad when we ran Eagles Canyon that the pit made us take our heat shield off and hang it on the fence 20 feet away from the garage because it was awful. And from then on, every car we had built out of Oklahoma had in paint pen 
rub cheese here on the heat shield, but that shows how effective those heat shields are. So that is an option. If, if you're, if you've got space and you're worried about heat, what Chrissy just said is valid. Yeah. A little ever, gap and a little space is actually a great heat shield. Have you ever seen one of the, if you have, or if you have one of those little thermo cams and you just point it at an engine with a heat shield, it's amazing. You can just see how much it, difference it's, ju it's, yeah. it's just some sheet metal and some air gap and it makes the world a difference yeah yeah and, and it's <laughs> it's the science and i'm going to jump around a little bit because i'm actually was going to talk about this thing so um they're also really light they, they really don't weigh much those little pieces of tin that go around there um so sometimes if you can get that gap and a, and a little heat shield definitely do that because it's great um but it doesn't always work because there was no space in the floor of the S10 and the, the 4.3 liter Chevy puts about a millimeter between that exhaust manifold, the downpipe and the starter. So like, this is just things you really need to check because you can roast electronic equipment a lot by not watching this heat. So we actually moved to a Camaro starter because it was like half the size and it, it moved the starter away from the pipe by that extra like inch and a half. And it made a world of difference to how much heat went in that starter grind metal. And we discovered this because we had a red flag situation at New Hampshire and I shut the boat off. And then I went to start the boat when we went to a uh, yellow flag situation and we could on the camera, we could watch the voltage drop every time I'm trying to start, but it wouldn't go. And that's how we recognized that we were heat soaking the starter. Yeah, Chris. We're also been... melting shoes. It's true. It's true. My shoe <laughs> melted in it. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you cut the tabs off of the manifold for the K24 and put them on the header. Is that is that the story there? How did yeah. that work? Well, as the motor we got came with a stock manifold, which was kind of a tubular manifold, but it wasn't going to work for its shape and size wise. So we ended up with a header which we'll talk about tubular headers in, in a second because that was kind of our intro to this section. So I cut the mounting tabs for the heat shield off of the stock manifold and I just weld them, welded them to the new header and then did a little trimming on the heat shield and boom, I just took that beautiful, nice, well-engineered OE stock heat shield and adapted it to my header. And that Honda exhaust gets hot. Like it gets so hot, it melted all of the paint off of the big glass pack that I put under the whole center tunnel of the floor. Like the paint just is gone. Glass packs, yo, that's the way. It, yeah, that's, well, that's all that fits. We, we've the said the word so. header like a thousand times. We should probably jump back to that. For those of you who don't know what that means, because there are some people out there who are a little bit earlier in this, um, a, a, a cast manifold is like one giant big piece of cast steel that they kind of stamp iron. with a machine. Iron, sorry. Whether they stamp with a machine, it's stamped and it's big, it's heavy, it's usually rusty. It's always rusty. It's rusty like five minutes after they cast it and it, it's 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 a big lump but it's a tube so everything is a tube well, it's, most a most manifolds are not tubes jeff they're actually they're actually actually cast like they pour liquid metal into a, a casting yeah 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 and that is what flows so it, it's it's not necessarily a tube it is a passageway that's not a tube a tube headers are tubular. Like I, I mean, there's a there, there's a hole inside that the flow okay. through. That's what I meant. Because there there are there are stamped steel manifolds that are a third difference. That's not a oh. cast iron, and it's not a tubular header. It's a stamped steel one. God, I've never seen that Sorry. ever in my life. So anyway, cast is the casting process. Tubular headers are instead of one giant block of steel that happens to have holes excuse me, iron that has to have holes in it that make a tube. It's actually a tube. So it's tubes that are put onto, welded onto a plate that's going to bolt to your motor and the tubes bend down and they come to a collector. So like the, when we say four into one tubular header, what we mean is the four exhaust po ports enter four tubes and all attach at the same place. There's things called like tri-y headers where the two go into one and the other two go into one and then the two main, the two secondaries go into part, whatever. Just so you know, when we say things like four into one header or two and two into two, it's all tri-y. Anyway, they're all tubes, just like the internet. 
Why do you want a header? Because they sound cool, right? Everybody wants headers, yo. Woo, woo. Put some headers on my Camaro, yo. No, no. Um, they're lighter. <laughs> they are usually take up less space in your engine bay. They are a lot smaller than the giant, thick cast manifolds. So that's why they're so much lighter. You can get a ton of them. And they also design them in different ways. They design them for, some of them are designed for performance. Uh, we have shorty block hugger headers, which meant that they are not long tube headers. Long tube headers means that that collector where it, where it enters the four into one is further away from the engine. And that's a different performance variety. Shorty headers mean the collector is closer to the motor. Block hugger means it is physically closer to the motor. So all of these words you're going to see when you're shopping for headers, just know that it's almost impossible to figure out which one fits your car. If you're putting a, 4.8 liter LS into a 300 Z from 1990. So, uh, but anyway, unless it's been done 50 times before, unless it's been done 50 somebody, times before yeah. somebody already knows. Yeah. So yeah, I tubular headers are also really cool because if you're really cool, like Chris and you can weld, you can actually adjust them. And there are people who make their own headers. Uh, shout out to the GRM people. Um, uh, uh, Andy Nelson, uh, if you ever want to look Works at what art, they're amazing. Yeah, he can make a Chevy rat motor breathe like nobody's business. And he does it by cutting and welding his own tubular headers. So there is an art to it. Just know cast manifolds are really freaking heavy. They don't flow as well. They look like big, heavy logs under your thing, under your hood there. And you want to probably get headers and you're going to have to figure out how to make them fit. But you can bang them and smoosh them a lot easier than you can that cast manifold. Go ahead, Mental. And also uh, sexy tubular header work. Uh, Tin Man 392 on Instagram, the guy that actually Ooh. built Black Betty. Uh, he has done, he is right now he's, he's building a 68 fastback onto an old Arca frame. It's gorgeous, but go through his feed. He built a firing order set of manifolds that went four to two to back to four for his Corvette Z06. That was oh. beyond amazing. Do you have his Instagram up on your phone right now? Stick that in the camera. Hopefully go up a little, focused. go up a little. We want to see oh. the picture, not his picture. Not oh, his yeah. face. We want to see the picture. Uh, it's hard to see. All right, let me. Yeah, w what I need to do is actually just make a. a yeah, let's, let's let's look at the Camaro. It's or the uh, Mustang itself. There's a good shot of the Mustang that he is modifying yeah, right now. Yeah, and it's probably nice. better if I turn my uh, spotlight off there. No, nope. That's ah. Even... Don't worry about it. Okay. Anyway, Tin Man three ninety two. Tin Man three ninety two. Awesome. Uh. So anyway, so there is another way to keep the heat inside the manifolds or inside those headers and that is wrapping the headers chrissy i don't know why this position is mine and not yours like wrapping headers everyone raise your hand who wrapped headers in the last three weeks that's right chrissy did um, not, not three weeks but i've done it yeah I've, i i did exhaust but so anyway chrissy uh do you want to talk about wrapping headers or do you want me to jump into it i can do it screen you didn't re pre-read Wrapping headers. Why do you wrap headers? To hold the heat in. Okay, that means you're taking a a, a non-conductive material and you're literally, it's like a material, it looks like cast material. It's and fiberglass. You're wrapping it in. It's fiberglass. You fiberglass. It's nasty. Your hands. And you're literally Life. creating a barrier between the manifold and the rest of the engine. It looks um, like a fiberglass tie-down strap. Yeah, Basically. I was gonna like a cast. If you, I guess more yeah. people have probably done fiberglass tie down straps than casts, but um, they do trap moisture. So in like your street car, if you're making that like you know thousand point uh, show winning Mustang and you're wrapping your headers, it, it's gonna eat up the metal because it's gonna trap that moisture and it's gonna create rust. So you eventually will uh, rust out and warp your headers. Race car. Who the hell cares? You're probably going to be replacing it in a couple of years anyway. So we wrapped them up. Um, also, if you call your favorite ceramic engineer, he might give you some special juice Number that you can three? that you can paint on ceramist. your ceramist. Ceramist. You can paint. Oh, he said on ceramic heads. engineer is also acceptable. Oh, Both. okay, but, okay, but not ceramist. I thought he said that's that's an extra that's an extra. 
It's actually syllable. Ceramist. I thought it was ceramist. Um, Ceramist or ceramic ceramic engineer. Whatever. Uh, So anyway, he's going to give us a custom blend of some sort of ceramic mojo that is going to like actually make everything just, we're we're just going to have an extra layer. It's belt and suspenders to try and keep all that heat out of our engine because you don't, or excuse me, the engine bay, because you don't want to crispy your wiring and you don't want to fry it up. And in case you've never seen an LS motor, where are the 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 ignition wires right between every single header right tube. <laughs> every header tube has ignition wire right passing through it let's hope it works fortunately they have little little metal little belts heat and shields that go on them, and- so. and i i did melt one of them i did we we had one melt when i was running the uh gingerman the melvin wood car the ls swap bmw we were running seven cylinders all day saturday we didn't realize it uh, so they are some of the ones we took off just in case we needed you're a always spare. gonna need spares yeah, yeah. yeah. All, all right Chrissy what else we're we moving on to exhaust so this is our last topic so hold on to it because if you're bored we're almost done okay so um your goals here are doing get get the exhaust to exit outside the car ideally behind the driver uh, ideally be out the back all the way out the back to not to annoy to not annoy your competitors as they pass you at this uh, with you, your side exe- exit exhaust blaring in their ear. Then you have, to, oh, this is a mess. Um, to have a car. Can I start over? <clears throat> no, it's just a run on sentence. And that's why it's, I'm struggling. To have a car, it's loud enough that you could hear it, but quiet enough to pass the sound regulations and not fatigue you for long, exe- long shifts. Do the exhaust better, make it go out the back. Keep it loud, but not too loud. That's what you should have said. Mike try. And and those regulations are no joke. Out here on the West Coast, several tracks have uh, serious noise regulations. And for the, you guys on the East Coast thinking you don't have to deal with this, you've never been to NCM. They absolutely do. Now, to make these exhausts, you can buy a few of the pre-bent mandrel bends and some straight pieces as well. Just a generic exhaust kit. And it's going to have all those bits in it, like our friend Matt was just doing on the fail bird to get it ready for Laguna Seca. So get as big a muffler as you can that fits most dimensions and it'll keep the sound down. A performance version is fairly straight enough and it's potentially chambered. We could do an entire show on just muffler types and Ford, Chevy sort of debate, but bigger equals quieter and loud does not equal powerful. <clears throat> for piping, you're going to want all of this uh, Whatever. There's my mandrel kit. Jeff, Jeff is holding up the, the mandrel kit. Now, $33. For piping, can't beat it. If you're going all out on this effort, you don't want to use small pipes. You want to let that engine breathe. Not for noise, but to get the exhaust out. We recommend at least two and a half inches for single setups. And some duels can get down to two, two and a quarter if they're small and you're doing lower RPMs. And it depends on what you can fit. The bigger the engine and the higher the RPMs you run, the more flow you're going to need. Get the gas out of the way so the new stuff can come in. A 2.4 liter engine at 8,000 RPMs is the same as a 4.8 liter engine at 4,000 RPMs. Design your setup with that in mind. Don't forget your O2 sensors, weld on bungs, (laughs) bungs, and potentially a catalytic converter if you want to comply with the EPA or clean air quality. Cats really don't inhibit the flow much like they did a long time ago. And most engines are, are actually designed to work with them. I, I just realized that the 4.8 liter that we're putting in the Z is twice the size of the Honda motor. <laughs> is it twice the horsepower? No, not but even close. As someone who grew up in the 70s, realistically, it's was... about 60 more horsepower. <laughs> <laughs> as, as someone who grew up in it's the like 70s, it's like Honda can build efficient things and Chevy can't. Well, that's also the smallest LS. Like, yes, if we ran it at 7,000 RPM with a hot cam, like we could get it. No, we really couldn't get it no. to, to twice the power. <laughs> no, no. But, but, anyway. that, but that does go to a thing. There's a lot of just old misconceptions and that louder is, is flows better and hence is more powerful. And for a lot of engines, they are designed with a certain amount of back pressure in mind to keep from floating your valves. So just don't think that because it's loud, you're going faster. Yeah, but yeah. louder is cooler. Yeah. yeah. Until you drive your car without your um, noise blocking earphones in and say, Oh God. Oh, 
Ow. <laughs> did did I, I ever tell this? you that, uh, A, I love intimidating people with the exhaust of the Honda? Like when you're on their bumper and they're in your in your way, you give them a little blip of the throttle and they can really hear you. After the race, I do that in my street car and nobody notices. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm like, why plus, is this guy out of the way? Vroom, vroom, vroom. And I'm like, I didn't, didn't make any yeah. noise. Then there's the thing where like you're walking back away from pit wall after you just got out of the car and you stop the new driver in and the other two pit crow and you're doing the, you know, that was a really great shot. I can't believe how awesome it and, and your two teammates are going, shut up, shut up. Yeah. Why is he talking so loud? Yeah. Why is he yelling at me? I'm right here. Oh, your teammates might be hung over too. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still talking too loud. Yeah, exactly. And, and having a bread fight. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yep. What else do we need to say? Well, you actually have to make this whole damn exhaust. Oh, sure. I know, right? Oh. And, and let me tell you, this is fiddly bits, one step at a time. You start at the forward end of the car and work your way back. In general, you're going to use a straight piece and then a piece of the bend with it, and then more straight. Repeat. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> it's right, very technical. Bend, right, now the, I know how bend, to do it. You got it. The bend can be part of one of those mandrel J's or U's. You can use you know, kind of the straight leg with part of the bend in it, or you could just cut it like a pie cut out of the bend to attach the two straight pieces. Um, you know, you also can cut a wedge or a pie cut out of a straight piece and bend it shut and then weld it sealed. That works for small cuts. When you get into big cuts, that's a terrible way to make it flow. Like you don't want to do that very often. But for small angles, it, it's a really efficient way to do it. So there's that. Um, really, as you go, cut and mark the pieces. Get another piece of tubing to kind of hold up to the end of it so you can see where it's really pointing, not where you think it's pointing while you're lying on your back and with 18 inches between you and the car. And as you go, just cut and mark them and lightly tack weld them together. Really lightly tack them because if you make a mistake, which you're likely to, you can cut it back apart. And, and weld it. And so that, that's the way you want to go. So lightly tack them all together. Uh, this is going to take some time because you have to make a piece, check it, get back out from under the car, back under the car, measure something, back out from the car, cut another piece, back under the car, check it, out from under the car, repeat. Now, now I've seen people try and do this with like pool noodles, like build it out of pool noodles and then take it to the deck and try and build it out of yeah. pipe. The, the best I've seen is if you, if you use a long kind of welding rod that'll hold the bend, you can kind of put it in the middle of where something is supposed to go and uh, that'll get you close. Yeah. yeah. Who the hell has welding rods anymore? Like, well, you can go take people. They have welding I guess. Rods. I mean, fine. Use a coat hanger. It, yeah. Yeah. There thing. you go. That's better. Use a, use a sturdy piece of metal wire. Um, so uh, another thing is you're going to need to have some flexibility in your exhaust. Because the engine and chassis do not move completely together. The engine flexes around in a different way than the chassis with most mounts. And if you have solid mounts, then I'm sorry. that's Your life is going to be yeah, terrible. It's bad. Yeah. Uh, they're not, so you, They're not the faster. They're not cooler. You're an idiot. Yeah, they're and just terrible. it's still going to flex between the chassis and the engine. Yeah, probably. Because yeah. your chassis is going to flex. Because if you're doing this, you probably have an F body or yeah. a Fox body. <laughs> and therefore, it's going to flex. So um, there's a reason anyway, they call it the Ford flex, right? It's, use a flex joint in your exhaust somewhere in the front half of the car so that it can move. It also makes it so much easier to, to install and remove the exhaust. If you have some flexibility in it, um, I'm worried it, that we don't have enough flex because we only have one flex joint. I know will, you say one is fine, but I think it'll be enough because then it's not moving together. I, let's see if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, who's the one that's going to have to fix it? We cut it apart. And we had a flex joint. This guy. Yeah, right. Yeah, I know exactly. I only had one when I built it, so I would screw you guys. Another one. <laughs> that's fine. They're straight. It wouldn't even be I that know. hard to put one in. Uh, yeah, that's why. Let's start the car. Okay, okay stop it! Stop okay, it! Go on. Anyway, if you don't let stuff flex that moves, it's going to break, and maybe it'll break. Who knows? You are also going to need flexible hangers. We usually just reuse the stock hanger yeah. material and the rubber mounts and weld those on because they're good quality and you already own them. That's good. Um, you also and, need some kind of. And there's nothing wrong with them. They work no. really well. Yeah, just cut the cut the solid rods off the exhaust tubes and weld it on your new ones in the right spot. Done. It's easy. Um, you're also going to need some way to take this whole thing apart. If you have one tube that goes from your header 
to your tailpipe, you're going to be sad because you're going to need to take it off. And it probably goes under some suspension parts or something. And it's just, it's annoying. So you're going to need a, some kind of joint. Uh, we like V band clamps. They're the best solution. We don't yeah, even have any, but no. I know they're the best solution. They're, they're they awesome. seal tightly. They come apart easily. Uh, the flat flanges or the U clamps that bend the pipes and lock them together. They, they always still leak. I mean, the flat flanges are okay, but they're just, they're more difficult to use. So, um, and lastly, in your design, make sure you keep all of the exhaust as far away from fuel as you possibly can. That's a good tip. And consider heat shields anywhere near fuel or sensitive bits because that that simple piece of sheet metal and air gap goes a long way. Heating fuel leads to all kinds of weird problems and danger. Don't do that. The, the show is going really Go ahead, Metal. You go first. And not just the obvious bit like explosions. We had to give so many cookies to the tow truck drivers at pit race because we had an exhaust that was vaporizing fuel before it got to the engine and causing a vapor lock. And it took what Saturday for us all to figure that out. And these, yeah. th this was not a pack of stupid people. We well. were just that cosmic you know, <laughs> that could be well, discussed we were getting into the tr on purpose but but the, the point stands is it because it was so difficult to diagnose it, it took us out of contention for an entire day well when you don't have fuel flowing you go oh the fuel pump must be bad so you change the fuel pump and then when your fuel pump is you know it's running you're like oh it's fuel still not flowing so let's put yeah. let's do there's the there's no such filter, thing as over, and then let's do this and yeah. you know there's no such thing as an over shielded exhaust yeah, right. Yeah, pretty much. Absolutely right. Okay, All so right. that's that's it for this week. If we haven't dissuaded oh. you yet, listen next time. I, I we'll think the brain is it. broken. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And you got questions or you've got examples or you think we're full of crap, let us know. Hey, if someone out there built a really sexy header, we want to see the picture. That's true. Yeah. Because we yeah. don't do that shit. Okay. But anyway, what's next? That's time for... Hell sweet but terrible. Thanks. It's all you, Jeff. That's a great intro. I yell. Hey, I you're scream. so boring. I make like a, a, a to do. Hell is sweet but terrible. So uh, I already so mentioned. Bad, so bad. That's good. I like that. I like yeah. It. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mentioned that I went car shopping. So I, I feel like I need to do some exploits in car shopping. And you can all tell me whether I am uh, doing things right or doing to things totally wrong. Uh, just to refresh people's memory, I need to replace my 2012 Mazda 3, which has 178,000. It's just about 180,000 miles. Want, Jeff. Want, Jeff. Not I need. want. Don't, want. Don't, don't, don't need. You're absolutely right. I want to replace it. Um, and I had it down to, I was really thinking about the Ford Focus ST. I wanted them with the Recaros, uh, but I read that the Recaros are not comfortable. And my wife said, "You drive a race car. What's it going to pinch your butt? You're all used to it. Just stop being a pansy and go drive one, and you'll like it because it's got sporty seats that hold you in." So I found a Ford Focus ST with the Recaros, and this one was not the one I was going to buy, but you know I could test drive it, and it had the loudest freaking exhaust, not including the Honda, that I've ever heard out of a four-cylinder motor. It had a blow-off valve that was louder than the trombone that blows Erling out of his seat on the bus. All right? This thing was worked. The Ford Sync stereo had a half-naked... A uh, woman on it of undeterminate. Oh, this is quality. Age. Dark skin. No, dark. I was gonna say it, it was hard to tell whether she was she was a Latina woman. She was boobalicious, but I, whatever. I don't know. Like so I, she was, I, she was definitely feminine shaped. She was. Oh yes, yes she was. So anyway, so this wasn't the one I was gonna buy, but I was really just there to try out the seats. And how were the seats? You asked. They sucked. I hated these seats. And I, it wasn't that they were too squeezy or that they were too narrow. The butt angle was all wrong. Like it felt like it was pushing my knees up away and it was totally unadjustable. Uh, I literally got out of the car and I said, well, I'm really glad I did this because now I will not buy a car with these seats and I will buy the lower trim model with the other seats. And so I started searching on the internet to find one of those to make sure those seats were comfortable. Um, but then it doesn't have the options that I want. Was this, uh, was this stock? Stock. They're, they're leather Recaros. I was more and, concerned about what's on the radio. 
Oh no, the radio. Well, that was like it's like a it's like Google. It's like you Apple can, CarPlay, so you can yeah, okay. make a new you can background. put different things on there. Okay, yeah. yep. And okay. I want the Apple CarPlay slash Google. You know the 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 Android Auto. Um, so if I get a lower trim model, I will have to upgrade the radio. It doesn't matter because this is what happened next. I put out a bunch of feelers to a bunch of places that had Veloster ends, and a dealership contacted me from Baltimore that had a 5,000 mile Veloster end and said, would you like to come down for a test drive? Start up the car. I'm going to Baltimore. Um, no one said ever, but good on you. Yeah. <laughs> so I worked Saturday, but they had Sunday hours and I went down and I drove a white Veloster N and I think I still have the pictures up. Let me see if I can find the picture. I don't have the pictures up. Uh, it was gorgeous. It's a stock Veloster N. Um, I, I got the vapors a little. <laughs> good, you got the fizzies. That's good. Everything and, and, that they are writing about this car is true. And this is important because when you posted the picture on our Instagram, which you can follow at everyone.racers, our good friend, Dr. Florida Man Donnie said, if you're going to use it as a soup filled dumpster, you should spend maximum dollars. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it was really pretty. Looks like a white Veloster N. It, it is. Okay. looks like a white Veloster N. Uh, I want to tell you that a, the COVID has brought something really interesting. No dealer personnel on the test drive. We had this. I know we know. Yes. Yeah. So raise your hand. If you did triple digits on a dealer plate, <laughs> did we no uh, i have in the past oh yeah. When, oh yeah when i bought my 98 integra brand new in 98 and i was 19 my friend paul and i went out in the test drive just the two of us the guy just handed us the keys what did no, that's crazy oh, an idiot. that guy and a new right integra gsr holy crap yeah yep so uh i but did they, but it... did the guy make the sale chris Oh, yeah. I yeah, bought that car. Yeah. I didn't oh. buy that car. I bought a different one. Yeah, so so these people probably made a sale because I probably will buy, buy a Veloster N, uh, but I will not buy that Veloster N because at 5,000 miles, they pretty much wanted 30 grand for it, which is what it's stickered for once it was tax tagged and everything else. Um, but it was like the very, when I got on those backcountry roads and I put it in N mode and this, the exhaust start, sounded really sexy. And then it auto blipped the throttle when I downshifted Ooh, for the roundabout. Pretty. I said, I have not felt this since I drove the GT3 on Extreme Experience. And it's not that it's the fastest thing and not that it's the best thing, but I just really felt like this car was absolutely communicating the handling and just everything that I wanted. And the trunk is a little smaller. Yes, Chrissy, but it's totally serviceable. Um, the back seats are probably about the same size as the three. There is no leather anywhere. It's a plasticky interior and I, I don't care. That thing blipped that throttle on that downshift. And I went, oh, oh. More than half of the people that commented on the Instagram post were in agreement that the Hyundai, and that includes, uh, you know, Hooniverse Jeff, a former guest on our show, who absolutely said the Hyundai is always the better choice. Way better than the Ford Focus ST. It's also 10 grand more than the Focus ST. There's a reason for that. Yeah, yeah. And, and you can't find any STs that aren't already worked and roached and... You know, they're, they're just getting naked, thinner and thinner naked, on the ground. Naked ladies on the... Well, the the Veloster ends are probably not going to be too far behind. You've got to get one. <laughs> well, and this is the case right now. Yeah. The market is so hot. I literally went in and talked to the sales manager for a minute, nearly puked on his shoes and punched him, by the way. Dealership people are still the scum of the world. So I'm pretty sure I will buy a Veloster end from Carvana, and I will not talk to a human until the tow truck driver delivers it. Um but like, I know we're going late, but this will just be one second. So he shows me the sheet. I brought it here. You know, his, his printed, what, what, what do they call that? A four square, you know, like, and they got the. Oh, he's you know, telling he's you got, your payments. He's oh, got my payments. payments are there and he's got all the stuff on it. And, and he's got this line here and it's like, it's like $1,900 for, uh, for de reconditioning. 
<laughs> right. And, and now I want to tell you that I heard the story of this car. This car was traded in <clears throat> for Freaky. somebody who wanted a blue one and the flappy paddle transmission. So he literally bought it there, brought it back a year later with 5,900 miles on it and bought it. So he had his snow tires on. He brought it to the dealership with the snow tires and he said, um, I need my snow tires back. So take the brand new wheels and tires off the one I'm about to buy, put it on my old one and take off however much he negotiated to take off. So it had brand new tires on it that still had like the stickers on it. I mean, minus whatever all of us test driving idiots roached off of them. So, but anyway, I said $1,900 for reconditioning. It has 5,000 miles on it and brand new tires. What did you recondition? And he said, oh, that's a Maryland state law. We need to inspect it. And we need to, you know, he gave me some kind of bullshit. So I immediately said, well, I'm going to be perfectly honest here now. And you can go ahead and run whatever number you want, but I don't want to waste your time because I'm not going to buy this car today. And it's not because your price. It's because this is the very first one I've ever, you know, I tried to be honest with him. And he goes, if I got rid of that reconditioning, would that be, would that get you to buy it today? I'm like, mother, you just told me five seconds ago. It was a state law. I was so mad. And I was that like, is why, and that is why the dealership model is dying. Dead. My, dead. My, I'm not buying it from a dealer. No, my brother worked at a Cadillac dealership in North Carolina, and that is actually his job is to recondition cars. And there is no way he is putting $1,900 worth of work. And my brother is very good at what he does. In a, 5,000 mile car. Correct. <laughs> Under warranty. Yep. Under warranty. <laughs> anyway. All right. I'm glad you found something that gives you the fizzies. That's but this good. is not going to happen right away. I'm going to get some ducks in a row. I'm going to finish paying off a, a different it's loan. Ducks. That I have. They're so annoying. And, and so we're probably talking, and I'm going to try and hope that the market cools down a little because I literally talked to that guy for 10 minutes. I went outside and they were already handing the keys to the next person who was test driving it. I, uh, I also, one of the other comments we got from our buddy, Alex Levinson is uh, you, sh you owe it to yourself. And we mentioned this when you brought it up, you need to try the Fiesta ST. I can't find them either. True. But the Recaros yeah. and the Fiesta ST are actually different than the VR. Uh, That's Ford interesting. Uh, in the Focus. I, look, I have plenty of time. I'm going to test drive everything. I'm going to test drive it. a WRX. I'm going to test drive a GTI. Go. I'm never going to there buy a go. GTI, but or a WRX. I might buy a WRX. I like all over a GTI. Oh, over no. any of them. The Super well, yeah. Super is going to blow its motor. The WRX or the the Volkswagen is going to blow everything else. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, 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 to be honest, I'm probably not buying any of them because I really want the Veloster N. But who knows? You this know is the what? First time I, in my life, I've ever said the Hyundai is the best one of all the cars you're considering, and I don't <laughs> say that lightly. That's what kept saying that he was like, "I'm also going to drive the, right the one. Mustang." You're like, it's not. That's if, not always the truth. If I can find someone to let me drive a Type R, I'm going to drive a Type R. Because it well, and here's another thing: the 2020 Veloster ends were twenty-seven thousand dollars or twenty-nine with the performance pack. The 2021s are all thirty-four and they're all performance pack. So they buy they basically put on five thousand dollars just because they're like, oh shit, we have the hottest car in America. I guess we should pay. We should make everybody pay a little more. So if you're a Midwest dealer and you've got a Hyundai Veloster uh, R line or N on and, your lot and you can't move because it's winter. Get a hold of us at everyone.racers at gmail.com, which uh, like someone did when they saw our Citron video. Citroen. Yeah, I still got to email that guy. Yeah. Man. <laughs> He's hot. Right. Oh, he check off. It? Somebody says Citroen wrong. Yes. Good. That's a good one. That one's been, hasn't been around in a while. Uh, uh, so next on. week, we have a switcheroo because CNC are going to be traveling, celebrating two of the four best days on this podcast. Uh, well, five best days. I'm on the this only podcast. one who's not that excited by my birthday. I'm like, birthday comes around. I'm like, whatever. When their you're time, their death. time. Yeah, no, their time is coming, Jeff. We know how it is. Point being, I don't really care. We're having Dave and Ian from the Apex Adjacent Podcast. Now, if you don't listen to their show, you should give it a try. Uh, if you do listen to the Apex Adjacent Podcast, it's going to be interesting. Like when we were on the Untitled Car Show. So it's kind of a WWE SmackDown meets the delicious dish. That's their I, style. I don't know which one we are. <laughs> we're, we're totally SmackDown. Oh, okay. But regardless, they are interesting people. It's going to be a fun show. You should tune in and listen. And I think Chris and Chrissy are going to be listening to it going, those idiots, they can't function without us. 
it, it it's true but we they they do a great uh what is it fmk which is like yes f, f marry yeah, yes, kill f, a vehicle which which we're going to be doing on a, uh when we have them on so it'd be great yeah i i have to say that um I listened to them. I listened to like four or five episodes because I had to drive back and forth to Baltimore. And I was like, this is great. Whenever we do these crossovers, we get new listeners. And all they talked about was Donnie. They're like, oh, yeah, we had Donnie on the show. Like, Freaking Donnie. He's everywhere. Anyway, he listen everywhere. here. Thanks for downloading us. We hope you enjoyed another edition of Everyone Racers. I hope you'll join us in the world of driving, racing, and building except don't do that motor swap because everyone can be a racer, but you're not good enough to do a motor swap. Trust us. We're not good enough. And we're really good at this. If you enjoyed this podcast, subscribe. It's totally free. Then go to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. Even if you hate us, give us five stars and tell us why. If you have any questions or show ideas, or you want to make fun of me or offer me that 7,000 mile Veloster and you have sitting in your yard, uh, contact us uh everyone.racers at gmail.com or hit us up on the facebook page or text mental i do want look at them every now and then 484-243-0455 find our instagram or twitter at everyone.racers thanks again and until next week keep the shiny side up because you swap the motor and that thing's leaking and it's all oily on the other side <laughs>